everybody. Let's see if I can make this work. It's a precarious in place here, but that won't fall throughout the course of our discussion. Uh, I've never been one for podiums, so if you guys don't mind, I'm going to range around just a little bit uh, while we're talking. Uh, thank you again so much for having me here today. Really, really a pleasure to talk about a topic that is uh, deeply complex and fascinating, uh, but often under-discussed in, in contemporary society, despite uh, the presence of tobacco in so many uh, facets of society. So uh, before I get going, I just want to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, it's mostly public health. Uh, I did my MPH uh, due to inclement weather in New Orleans around 2005 at uh, Tulane and at Hopkins, but then um, my background is also in health education and clinical tobacco treatment. So that's the CTTS and their back. Uh, so I've had the opportunity before coming to Philadelphia to work with the Department of Public Health to work in a variety of clinical settings to treat uh, tobacco use disorders. So uh, hospital settings, behavioral health, uh, corrections, veteran settings, a little bit of everywhere. And I'm still fortunate enough to see patients uh, half a day a week at Health Center 2 in South Philly. So I still do see patients uh, clinically for tobacco use disorder treatment. And then I always joke that the last two credentials were the hardest earned and most costly of all those credentials is FS retired. Anyone care to hazard a guess what FS retired might mean? It's not like a forensic specialist or anything like that, I promise you. Yeah, the yeah, ice two packs a day. So I know this addiction very well professionally, but as well as personally. Uh, and that certainly informs you know, me getting into this field so many years ago. What I really credited getting me interested in tobacco policy and control was a uh, speaking engagement. Uh, so my current boss was then the department chair at Community Health Sciences at Tulane, brought in a guest speaker to talk about the tobacco industry and public health class, and it just blew me away. And I knew right then and there I was wedded mind, body, and soul to this issue, and I would work in it till my, till my dying day. Uh, so that's why anytime there's an opportunity to speak about this issue, yeah, oh, a little closer? Yeah, yeah. Anytime there's an opportunity to speak about this issue in a variety of settings, I'm, I'm always game for it. But then secondly, I was in the Peace Corps in Kenya, and I had, uh, it was two packs a day by that point, I was, I was close to quitting, and I noticed that there was uh, no running water, no electricity, no rural vehicles to speak of where I was located, but there were four brands of manufactured cigarettes that were sold. And it started to really change my thoughts around the tobacco industry. That every time I bought a pack, which was about a dollar a pack at the time, uh, I was supporting something truly heinous and evil. So to be clear, this conversation is not about the persecution of individual tobacco users. It's really about taking a deeper dive into the industry. Uh, that's really the epicenter and nexus of the tobacco pandemic. And the one really responsible for the tobacco use issue uh, throughout the world over. But I assure you that the truth, which we'll talk about today, is rarely pure and never simple, and has uh, a great many uh, dimensions that we're going to explore today. I hope, uh, in a twist in the Surgeon General's warning of old, that this presentation can be hazardous to your previously held perceptions about the tobacco industry. Because uh, I think what's important to start off with is to really reflect on how this is not an ordinary consumer product. Because I'll talk to a lot of art students, for instance, at PATH and University of Arts, that will say, well, everybody markets. What's the big deal? Uh, it's very, very important to reflect upon that this is the only consumer product that if used is directed by the manufacturer, kills up to half of its users. There is nothing else on any shelf that's even remotely close to that. So I took this picture of a storefront, and that's what I do on my weekends, and just kind of like roll around and take pictures of tobacco everywhere. But this storefront is a really interesting representation of that, right? You see cigarettes just mixed in with like paper towels and instant coffee and condiments like it's just any other consumer product when it's really a lethal and addictive drug. Uh, and it's been recognized as such by the World Health Organization, in fact. So I wanted to start off with just probing a little deeper on this idea of why do people smoke in 2019, right? First Surgeon General's report came out 50 years ago. There's been 30 or so Surgeon General's reports since that time demonstrating the impacts, individual, community level, societal impacts of tobacco use. Why do you think folks smoke still, given all that we know and understand about this issue? What do you think? So they're addicted, right? Strongly physically addictive. Good. What else? So yeah, it's macho. It's, you're independent, free thinking, rebellious, nonconformist if you use tobacco. Yeah, that's a big one. And then we'll talk about where do those notions come from? Are they just independently arriving in people's skulls around the world, or are they 
place there in some way, shape, or form. Why else? Some great addictive, it's macho. The technique for relaxation or stress. Yeah, to cope or manage or deal with stress in some way. Anxiety, or feelings, just emotional well-being in general. Uh, sorry, over here. Yeah, so this isn't a static industry, right? They're always, they're self-preservationists and survivalists, and they're always introducing new products uh, lockstep with how society is changing around their own perceptions of tobacco use. And one more in the back here. Yeah, reach for a lucky instead of a sweet, right? Yeah, Virginia Slims, right? All right, let's get one more, actually. Uh, it's a sign for young people of becoming an adult. Right, I'm not my mother's kid anymore, right? right? Yeah. So you guys hit upon many of these, and this is just a pictorial representation of many of the risk factors for tobacco use. Uh, you'll see sitting there like a spider in the middle of the web <laughs> is the tobacco industry. Right? right now, there used to be about seven big tobacco companies. Now there's around two or three. So Reynolds American, frame of reference, makes Winston's and Camels, Orlard, who makes Newports, but are now under the... Uh, sort of product portfolio of Reynolds, Altria, which used to be Philip Morris, but changed its name to Altria to sound more like a Nordic spring water than a tobacco company. <laughs> and then um, what you're seeing is all of those comments that you guys have just made represented pictorially. So marketing at the bottom, they spend about a million dollars an hour on marketing. A million dollars an hour. So the idea of stress relief is really sort of exemplified in this picture. No one ever looks upset in a tobacco industry yet. No one's ever short of breath. No one's ever like going through nicotine withdrawal. You're always thin, sexy, happy, wealthy, with white teeth and clear fingernails. It's a lie. It's a false, illusory message that's put out to sell a product, which again, other companies do, but this is a lethal and addictive drug. This isn't paper towels. This isn't instant coffee. You're also seeing here marketing in the form of point of sale advertising. So remember, tobacco industry can't do billboards anymore. It's illegal. They can't advertise with cartoon characters like Joe Cannon. So what they do is a lot of their money goes into point of sale advertising, interior and exterior advertising that you see above. You have family members or guardians or people you look up to and admire and respect using tobacco like your parents is a big risk factor for young people, but also uh, icons and creators in society. Like I idolize David Bowie when he's coming up. I idolize him. And him using tobacco was something I definitely noticed when I was a young person. What you're also seeing here is uh, smoking in movies. This is recognized by the CDC as a risk factor for youth tobacco use. Does anyone know that movie right there? Sigourney Weaver in that movie. It was seen by just a handful of young people. Avatar, right? Avatar was a global blockbuster. No one else smokes in the movie really but Sigourney Weaver. She smokes in one scene to show she's high strung and a little neurotic, but then she doesn't really smoke much the rest of the movie. So it begs a question. Why does she even need to smoke in a movie that's seen by legions of young people? And this gets into some complicated issues, right? So if you're talking about good night and good luck, Edward R. Murrow was a prolific tobacco user. So you're having some historical frame or reference that you're replacing in that film. But do you really need an environmental scientist in the future smoking cigarettes? What did that do to advance the plot of Avatar in any way, shape, or form? And this is what the result of all of those factors are. So what I'm really saying is, in my opinion, the tobacco industry is not just creating the supply, they're creating the demand as well. That's why those arrows are bi-directional. And it works. Marketing and all of these social influences in individuals, family, and communities are incredibly effective. So tobacco kills more people in Philadelphia because we have the highest smoking rates of the top 10 largest U.S. cities than opiates and gun-related homicides. So it's really hard to think of that because there are other issues as well they should that are garnering a lot of attention and resources right now and should because it's, we're in the midst of real tragedies in some of these issues. But it's also important not to lose sight of what tobacco is doing uh, in a city like Philadelphia. So what we're going to talk about, again, is not coming down on individual tobacco users but really the role of the industry in perpetuating the tobacco epidemic in cities like Philadelphia. And we're going to compare and contrast private industry statements with public industry statements. We're going to look at actual industry quotes and campaigns and key historical events. So the next step is naturally talking about Roman mythology, right? So the Roman god Janus was the god of two faces, uh, and those faces were thought to represent in some academic circles as 
you know, the embodiment of the past and the future, beginnings and ends and transitions. We're going to compare what the tobacco industry has said publicly with what they've said privately. And we'll do that in a color-coded fashion to make it nice and easy with the public in red and the private in green. Lots to go into here, but essentially tobacco has been used by many societies for millennia, for ritual purposes, for sacramental purposes, for self-medication. But even very early on, this is a treatise here by King James I in 1604, uh, acknowledging, and this is a great quote here, it's like lifted right from the Divine Comedy, right? Resembling the hard, stygian fumes of the pit that is bottomless, right? Such important statement. So, uh, very early on, centuries ago, it was recognized that uh, when it became more commodified and not used by, for specific religious purposes, and as tobacco became more of a commodified product, uh, then the public health arms of tobacco were starting to become more widely known. The first crop was grown in Virginia and the New World around 1612, but in a matter of about seven years, it became one of the largest uh, exports in the 13 colonies in 1619. And you see the roots of the tobacco epidemic as a social justice issue from its very nascent beginnings. So yes, it was cotton, yes, it was indigo that contributed to a very dark, dark chapter indeed in our nation's history with the slave trade, uh, but it was also tobacco because it was and still is a very labor-intensive, resource-intensive uh, product to grow. It even helped finance the American Revolution. Uh, this is a picture I used to live in Baltimore of uh, the founding father here smoking a stogie. Uh, he said, if you can't send money, send tobacco to the Continental Congress. Uh, nicotine was isolated from tobacco, which is again the addictive agent, in tobacco smoke in 1809. You see these early depictions, these sad and tragic depictions of slaves in, the, uh, in early American history growing and picking tobacco. But what really gave rise to the tobacco industry today as we know it is sort of the confluence of a few historical events together. One was uh, the cigarette rolling machine. It sounds very simple, but remember a lot of tobacco was hand rolled before this. But having a machine that could crank out cigarettes in a very easy uh, to use and in mass quantities was a big step. Matches, just having matches that were more widely commercially produced, where people could not wait till they came across fire, but produce their own fire was a big factor, and a marketing technique called parallelography you're seeing here at the bottom, uh, showing bare knuckle boxers and early baseball players marketing cigarettes, which is something this tobacco industry still does. There's a very strong connection for decades and decades to professional sports and tobacco industry marketing, were some of the factors that gave rise to the modern tobacco industry. The frame of reference, a major tobacco company cigarette rolling machine today can make 20,000 cigarettes a minute. You, know, like you can't even like handle that information, right? So we're talking trillions of cigarettes are made globally each year. And I think it's apt to put a munitions plant next to that to give you a, another swipe at the industry. So look what happened as a result of that. In the early 1900s, this was per capita consumption of tobacco. I mean, it just skyrocketed. But you're seeing here different events throughout the last century or so that have changed consumption of tobacco product use. So, you know, something you suspect of the Great Depression, not having a lot of disposable income in 1929 with the market crash. But then also big things like we just talked about, the Surgeon General's report. So just public health agencies coming out and saying smoking causes lung cancer was a major turning point in this. And you see there's been a decline in cigarette consumption going on for the last 40, 50 years or so, which is to a point the gentleman made here earlier why other products are being introduced as a plan what they're losing in terms of cigarettes. But yes, consumption has gone up, but social trends, public health campaigns, uh, numerous types of events can impact tobacco consumption to a great extent. A lot of the quotes that we're going to use are from something called the Tobacco Industry Document Library. If you've never seen this, I strongly encourage you to check it out. It is unbelievable, even for non-public health nerds. So this is about 14 million pages of internal documents. And if you ever wrote love letters when you were middle school or high school, right, you thought no one would ever read, I love you, you're great, let's go steady, whatever it was, that you feared that your teacher would read aloud in the class, this is kind of what that was. So they thought no one else would ever see this but other tobacco industry people or other industry affiliates in some way. 
Uh, but they did come to light, and they have some pretty damning content. Here's one example, and this is directly from the tobacco industry. This is RJR, before they became Reynolds American. And can someone read what's in the red box right there? Younger adults are the only source of replacement smokers. Why would you, who's replacement smokers? The ones who are dying. <laughs> Why would you call them replacement smokers? Why are you considered replacement smokers? Because they die. Die or quit. <laughs> yeah. So that's a pretty stark contrast to the industry saying, we never target kids, we're only for adults. So secretly, in these internal documents, they openly call kids replacement smokers. They basically replace adults that they kill and take their place after they die. Here's another one. Can someone read the uh, what's in the red circles there? No. Our target is more downscale. Typically, they are less educated than others. And then they're less formed intellectually, more malleable. So who are they talking about here? Who is this audience? Who's this demographic? Yeah. Yeah. It's less educated <coughs> and individuals with less income. So this was a deliberate pivot on the part of the industry in the late 80s, early 90s or so to say, you know, higher educated, higher income individuals are using tobacco less. We need to target poor, uneducated smokers. I mean, so this just shows you just with what complete lack of conscience and caring. People will sit around in a room and just scheme and plot on how to do this. So these documents were huge when they came out, but they didn't come out of the hands of this guy. They came out of the hands of this guy. I know. Not as not as squad as Sean Connery, is he? But this is the guy, Merrill Williams, who was a paralegal. And this is this is an unbelievable story. Essentially, he had worked as a paralegal at a major tobacco industry company and smuggled out all of these documents over years. He kept he actually put them in his clothing. And if you watch uh, documentaries on him, he will eat potato chips when he walks by the guard to like mask the rust <laughs> of the papers, like inside of his clothing. Because he was terrified to do this. But when he was coming across this, he said, I gotta get this out. Because at the time, remember the tobacco industry never lost a case in court, ever. If you went up against them, they would drag you through the courts until you went bankrupt and gave up. And then in these documents were them saying nicotine was addicted in the 60s. It was them saying they knew secondhand smoke was harmful. It was them saying how do we target kids? So let's take a, let's just take the first one head on. This is one of the big ones, right? So this is all from the Tobacco Issues website here. You'll see this lead in with statements like personal choice, personal freedom, liberties, adults, adult responsibility. This is a big talk point of the Tobacco Issues, right? It's for, for, for adults. And if people use tobacco, it's a choice that they're making. My argument here is, you're seeing this study here from the Harvard School of Public Health in 2007, when they increased the level of nicotine in their products without telling people. So imagine you're going to get tiramisu tonight after you go out, you know, the night at the movies or the theater. And unbeknownst to you, your local eater was adding crystal meth to your tiramisu without telling you. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is really good tiramisu, right? <laughs> but then secondly, it's an addictive drug. It's an addictive drug that they're unknowingly, without the consent of the American public, adding to their product to make it more addictive. And in my estimation, when you are addicted, it's supplanting your ability to choose. I work with patients all the time, walking with their jackets over their heads in the rain and the snow to get cigarettes at three in the morning because of nicotine withdrawal and cravings. Not because they choose to have ice and snow go down their boots, which sucks, right? I always hate when that happens. But because the addiction is saying, get up and go feed the beast. Get up and get me the drug that I want. So they're adding nicotine levels, increasing the nicotine levels without telling the consumer. And that is when your ability to choose starts to lose ground. Let's look at how they shape the environment. And this is older data. Fortunately, there's been some changes and trends in the city around this. What you're seeing is where smoking prevalence is highest is in some of our low-income settings. So where there are low-income settings, there's higher rates of smoking, more deaths from smoking, and there's more retailers in these areas. Again, this has changed through efforts of the health department and our partners, but there's more retailers, and there's even more retailers in your schools in low-income and minority settings. So what I'm saying is if you're walking to school as a child in Chestnut Hill, what you see is something totally different in terms of the tobacco retail environment than a child walking to school in North Philadelphia or South Philadelphia or West Philadelphia. And again, in my opinion, that's where choice starts to become a little shaky. 
then you're exposed to more marketing and advertising just by virtue of the color of your skin and how much money your family makes than a child who lives in two zip codes over, for instance. And here's a pictorial representation of that. That's the one tobacco retailer that a child walking to middle school will pass in Chestnut Hill. And this is four retailers on one corner alone in North Philly. And I've done this walk myself. A child will pass 16 tobacco retailers walking to school, whereas a child in another neighborhood may pass one. And these environments are shaped by the industry. It's the tobacco industry that creates these environments that provide the demand and the supply. Let's look at that a little further in this addiction and undermining choice idea. So this is, if anyone remember this happened, this was big news back in 1994. So the seven heads of big tobacco testified before Congress that nicotine was not addictive. All down the line, one after the other. So remember in the marketplace, definite competitors. But when their collective bottom line is threatened, they band together and have a unified front. And they did testify under oath that they did not believe nicotine was addictive, in spite of the fact that in 1979 and 1963, these are internal quotes from two tobacco companies, we're searching for a socially acceptable addictive product. Nicotine is addictive, we're then in the business of selling nicotine and addictive drug. And there's stories that you can tell for days about how this represents an individual struggling with this addiction. But this is Berger's disease. It affects the circulation in your extremities, which tobacco use does as well. So essentially, this guy here lost his fingers, hands, arms, and legs to his disease, which was worsened by tobacco use, and fashioned a coat hanger so he could still continue to smoke. I mean, I've, I've heard stories you guys can't believe over the years. People performing sexual favors in prison for cigarettes, uh, people running across battlefields in Korea to get cigarettes when they were out. I mean, this is an unbelievably addictive product. Habits are picking your nose and leaving the milk carton. You know, drinking out of the milk carton. Those are habits. But this is in every way, shape, or form an addiction. Here's another interesting quote from the industry saying, we can't defend smoking as a free choice if the person was addicted. So they're recognizing they've got a lot of interest in suppressing anything they knew about nicotine being addictive. So remember, just put this in a frame of reference. In 1994, they testified that it wasn't addictive. But in the early 60s, they openly acknowledged that it was addictive. So they knew for at least 30 years or more. Big one, targeting children. On their websites, minors should never use tobacco. Tobacco is for adults. No minors should use tobacco. No kids should use tobacco. But I think it's very important if you look at quotes from RJR, which you heard earlier, that they're replacement smokers. But also, this is a quote from Lorillard in 1978, almost 40 years ago, saying the base of our business is the high school student. 90% of all smokers start before the age of 18. Think about how many people over your life you know that lit up for the first time in their 60s. Not that right, right? If you get through around age 26, not using tobacco, there's less than a 1% chance you probably will. In addition, the brands most marketed to youth are the brands most used by youth, Marlboro, Newports, and Camels. So they have all these campaigns, for instance, like We Car, I got in a very interesting altercation at a conference once with the head of this campaign. Uh, he was, you know, was talking about all the things they do to prevent youth from accessing tobacco with the We Card campaign. And this is all from the tobacco industry, by the way. And I asked them, excuse me, sir, do you find it a bit inconsistent that you have this campaign to prevent youth access to products, but yet you're saturating the space with marketing materials that have been shown to make kids more likely to smoke? And I, got a very, I very much got the daggers back um, from that person's eyes when I asked that question. But, yeah, it doesn't seem terribly consistent. So again, they'll spend about a million dollars an hour. And the reason they said they do all this marketing when you look at their party line on this is that it's to prevent brand switching. We want Marlboro smokers to stay Marlboro smokers. We want Camel smokers to stay Camel smokers. When in actuality, it's very uncommon for people to change brands. That is changing because the price of tobacco is going up. A pack of cigarettes in Philly is around $12 a pack. Believe it or not, I know. I have a sharp intake of breath if I were you as well. And that's why people may switch from Newports to Mavericks because they're cheaper. So the industry has several tiers of types of tobacco products to keep people smoking rather than to keep people quitting because of the cost. But what I'm showing you here, and this gentleman's comment, I think somewhere over here, was like, yeah, I think it was yours, uh, sir, when you said, you know, I'm not my mother's kid anymore. So it's hard to see, but you see it down here at the bottom, from teenager to young single to young family to mature family to empty nest. 
and all these brands along the side, Carlton, Vantage, Merit, they're basically shedding up like a life, like a forecasting over the lifespan of what brand they want these people to smoke. Right? So you may start out smoking something lighter, but then they want to graduate you to the higher nicotine brands. So they know more about our kids than we often know about our kids. And this is all directly from their industry documents. And they recognize the smokers you, that you have are the smokers you're more likely to keep. So whatever they start smoking is the brand they're more likely to continue with. And if you don't believe the targeted kids, there's actually research evidence that the same flavor between Kool-Aid, Lifesavers, and Jolly Ranchers are used to flavor little cigars. So the same chem, not grape, apricot, pineapple, chocolate, but the same chemicals are used to flavor candy products as they are to flavor tobacco. Uh, and these are just pictures here I took in Philly of a child hit, being hit with tobacco industry advertising and walks into a retail space, and tobacco products right next to cookies, candies, and cakes in a retail environment. What about secondhand smoke? Another big bombshell in this hit. So there's a few things to know about secondhand smoke, but there's no safe level of it. If you can smell it, if you can see it, it's doing you harm, essentially. And it increases the risk of lung cancer, stroke, and heart disease by some studies up to 25 to 30% in non-smokers. And for decades, the industry has taken substantial efforts to try to discredit science on secondhand smoke, opposing smoke-free policies, funding economic and scientific experts, and aligning with the hospitality industry and funding front groups. Here's a good example of that. Uh, some of you in the room may know this, some of you may not. Remember going to the uh, restaurant and there was like that little partition that was here, and you'd sit on this side, and someone would sit on this side, and that was supposed to protect you from uh, all the smoke billowing over the top of the partition. Uh, it seems laughable now, but that was the norm forever. Uh, so this is an example of the tobacco industry saying accommodation word is getting around. So this is an industry sponsored campaign to basically say we just need to have separate sections and all is well. Uh, and I, my next colleague in California had this great riff on this where he had a peeing and a non-peeing section in the pool. And so that's about how effective you know, partition can, can really be. Uh, but what you're seeing here is they call it environmental tobacco smoke because they, they were very nervous about calling it secondhand smoke. Remember, if you eat a steak next to me, my risk of heart disease doesn't go up. But they were really spending years talking about this as individual choice, personal choice, etc. But when it started to become aware that secondhand smoke was harmful, they were very concerned about something someone was doing here affecting someone else there. So environmental tobacco smoke makes it sound like radon, like it's just naturally occurring in the environment, just bubbling up from the ground, secondhand smoke. When in actuality, you know, it's Exposure is occurring from being in proximity to a tobacco user. So you're seeing these examples here of trying to minimize the harm and likening it to driving a car and shoveling snow in terms of risk. Mind you, the secondhand smoke kills tens of thousands of people in the U.S. every year. They even hire uh, doctors and people that look like scientific professionals under Project White Coat uh, to cast doubt and dispersion on well-designed studies showing that secondhand smoke was harmful. And this is examples of them hiring doctors. This looks laughable by today's standards, but this was used for years, where doctors were front, you know, spokespeople for tobacco products. You know, less irritation for your T-zone, wherever that is in the body, right? That this is less harsh, less irritating. And you're seeing examples of other industries using this now, right? Where you have a, a vaping product, we throw a white coat and a stethoscope around someone's neck, and they're presented as a scientifically credible spokesperson. And dentists and nurses were in the game as well. What about corporate social responsibility and philanthropy? Very big area of its back industry. So over the years, they've done everything from sponsorship to funding scholarships, to events, uh, to donations, to a variety of organizations that are not coincidentally the same populations that have the highest rates of tobacco use. LGBT populations, rich and ethnic minorities, uh, behavioral health organizations, homeless serving organizations. Then at the same time they're doing this, they turn around and target them with a lethal and addictive drug. So much of this money is given to silence these organizations when there's uh, regulation or policy being discussed if they don't speak out, uh, but then also to endear themselves to these industries. And I'll show you some marketing examples of where they, they do that. But what you have to take home from this is that they don't give a damn about any of these people. What they care about is greed, power, and control. It's just, it's just hush money, essentially. 
Uh, they, they really have no major concern whether any of these populations that are listed here um, have opportunity or flourish or prosper. They just want to sell tobacco. And these are examples of some of those campaigns. So Project Scum, for instance, is subculture urban marketing. And this was a campaign to target homeless individuals in the Castro District in San Francisco. And that was the internal term they used, was Project Scum. And here's just some examples of that. Let's just take a look at African American populations. So they use everything from Malcolm X cigarettes, they use everything from Black History Month, to jazz music, to Black Power Movement, to hip hop culture. It's not a coincidence that that individual is holding a cigarette in their raised fist. It's all designed just to parasitize a very important social movement in this country to sell new ports. We have our own personal history of this. There's a brand of cigarettes called Uptown, which you probably never heard about because the African American faith and civic community rose up and got this pulled from the market before the tobacco industry could debut this. But not coincidentally, we have an Uptown theater here in Philly. Here's another example that targeting LGBT populations. Can someone read this for me quick? Freedom to... To speak, to choose, to marry, to participate, to be, to disagree, to inhale, to believe, to love, to live. It's all good. What a crop, right? I mean, like, it's just, it's just ridiculous, right? They, they do not care whether same-sex marriage becomes a societal norm. All they care about is whether LGBT populations smoke American spirits. What about promoting the economy, right? We, we, we're a job creator. We create all of this economic potential, right? And that's what we want to do as a company. Mind you that most tobacco users who continue to use tobacco die prematurely, sometimes by 10 years or more in terms of the shorter life expectancy. And they're often at the same time deprived of important income. I've worked with people that have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over their lifetime, and often low-income individuals, on tobacco products. So money that could be used for food, healthcare, education, clothing, um, better living environments, housing, etc. And they target the communities which are most vulnerable, perceived vulnerable to their influence. Number of LGBT populations, veterans, behavioral health populations, etc. And it costs the country about $300 billion a year. That's in healthcare costs, but also the uh, indirect costs, which are absenteeism and productivity. Example being, if uh, a child is, uh, gets an earache from secondhand smoke exposure, can't go to school, mom's got to take off to watch the kid, then she's not able to work that day. So that doesn't sound like much, but that racks up a considerable amount of money when you have tens of millions of tobacco users in the country. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones here, the globalization of tobacco. Anyone here seen the John Oliver segment on the global tobacco industry? It's really good if you haven't seen it. Definitely worth watching. But this is an example here from Philip Morris's international website. Because remember, Philip Morris International split off from Philip Morris. So now that's subject to US regulation. They're working internationally. And I love this picture of this guy in a mask, because he's either like, I'm a superhero, or either like, I don't need to know I work for a global tobacco company. I'll leave you to make up your own mind about what his true intentions are there. But then we're socially responsible at the local and global level. And this is, this is enough to make you physically sick, that if trends continue globally with tobacco use, that there'll be a billion deaths this century. One billion human lives will be ended prematurely by tobacco use, and 80% of those will be low and middle income countries. Remember, that's where they're going. The, the tide is turning in the US and in other Western nations, so they're going to Asia, Africa, Central and South America, and they're hitting these countries pretty hard in terms of their marketing. I was just in Vietnam uh, about a year and a half ago, very big producer of tobacco, but also cigarettes were about 80 to cents to a dollar a pack. That's it. Remember, $13, $14 in New York, but 80 cents in Vietnam. And then there's even an industry report where healthcare cost savings uh, are incurred by causing early mortality. So the industry basically said that we save on healthcare costs because we kill people early. And this is a billboard that you see called Be Marlboro in Indonesia with a child looking up at that billboard. Remember, you have no billboards in the US. Drive the 95, 76, you're not going to see them but they can be everywhere in other countries. And you're seeing this idea of rehashing old themes of industry marketing. So this is unbelievable, but global, uh, China national tobacco, so tobacco production is nationalized in China, and it's the biggest tobacco company in the world, essentially. And you're seeing, this is actually, I, I, I know not everyone here can read Mandarin, that's okay, I'll walk you through it. I can't read Mandarin either, to be clear, I'm just gonna read what this uh, says in the back. Talent comes from hard work, tobacco helps you become talented. 
So you have the tobacco companies building schools in China. There are more smokers in China than there are people in the U.S. Just let that sink in for a second. Over 300 million smokers. Uh, and you're, this idea, I do know Swahili because I was in Kenya, so it's Kila Mutu Anabuzori Waka, it means uh, every person has their own voice. What does that sound a hell of a lot like? Kind of, you've come, come a long way, baby, right? So it's this idea of like, you really want to be an emancipated woman, recognized on the same footing society as a man, you need to smoke. And this was done in the US for decades and decades. And this is what happened. So lung cancer, this is cigarette consumption in men, and then lung cancer in men following close on its heels. But this was mostly a male activity, you know, in the early 1900s. But this is then what happened. Women are free, ancient prejudice has been removed, smoke lungs. So they actually went, the lucky strike went out to women's suffrage rallies and handed out torches of freedom, is what they called them. They were just cigarettes. And then this is what happened. Lung cancer kills more and more women than breast cancer in this country. And that was the direct result of the tobacco industry's attention. The response to regulations. All right, we're going to comply with all regulations, all laws. We're on the side of public health, essentially. And I'll let you read this. This is some, like, this is enough to make your blood run cold. But this is them basically saying how they tear down politicians who oppose them. It's pretty scary when you read that, right? Like, if anyone steps out of line, we're going to pull their car and we're going to let everyone know that we're the ones responsible for doing that. And to show you the strange bedfellows that resulted in this, and you remember John Boehner? I know it's hard to even remember what happened longer than two years ago yeah. at this point, but John Boehner is on the board of Reynolds America. So it went right from politics right into big tobacco. The safe product, oh man, the holy grail of the tobacco industry, right? They said in 1954, this was in the frank statement of smokers after the lung cancer, the smoking connection became known. If we had any idea that what we were selling was harmful to anyone, we would pull it from the market. We would stop business smart, we'd roll up shop, that would be the end of it. So, fast forward to things like light cigarettes. What's the difference between light cigarettes and regular cigarettes? What do you guys think? Less tar? Less nicotine, less tar? It's really not much difference. Light cigarettes have two rows of ventilation holes here, which is meant to dilute the smoke, so it couldn't be detected on machines as easily that showed nicotine, tar, and carbon monoxide, and other things. But where do you put your lips and fingers when you're smoking? Right over those holes. So you're not getting anything safer. There's no light lung cancer, there's no light emphysema. But this was a big fraud. It was perpetuated against the American public. Because if you ask most people that smoke lights, they did think they were safer or less harmful when there was no evidence to substantiate that. And this is an uh, excerpt from the frank statement of smokers that appeared in major newspapers all over the country. Uh, and basically said, yeah, we're, we're going to change our tune. We're going to become responsible corporate citizens when they have yet to do so. Because right after that, this is them. Zephyr was a code word for lung cancer. So sometimes they had a feeling that some of these documents were going to get out into the public. So they would use code words to kind of mask what they were really talking about. Zephyr here really means lung cancer. Zephyr this, Zephyr that is just code speak for lung cancer in these documents. Anyone remember the Kent cigarette back in the day? So this came out right afterwards. What was in the first filter for Kent's? Menthol. Menthol. What's that? I'm sorry? Micronite filter, which actually had asbestos in it. <laughs> so yeah, they, they promoted this as a way to allay public anxiety and concerns. Say, we'll put filters on this, we'll make it safe, but the first filters on the Kent Microwave filter had asbestos in them. Here's another one, American Spirits. If you go down to certain parts of the city, that's what all young people are smoking, these American Spirits, thinking that this is grown on a Native American reservation out in South Dakota, when in actuality it's made by Reynolds America. So it's not an eco-friendly, environmentally aware cigarette is made by the same people making Winston's or Camel's. Someone asked about vaping, and I'm hoping at the discussion point we'll be able to, you can ask me more questions about that, because we could talk for hours about vaping alone. Uh, until you guys would tap down and be like, all right, man, enough. I just, I just need a break from all this, right? And I promise, because I know right now you might be feeling like this, I feel horrible. I feel apathetic, I feel despondent, but I promise, before we conclude in just a minute, 
I'm going to give you something you can use to fight back against these people. But remember, the vaping industry was all separate from the tobacco industry. And what's happened is that all the vaping companies are being brought out of the tobacco industry. So right now, all the major tobacco companies are making their own vaping device as we speak. And that includes, this just happened. So anyone heard of Juul before? Yeah. Biggest vaping product by far, about 76% of the market share is Juul. And Altria just bought a $13 billion share of Juul, or 35% market share. Which begs the question, right? If you as a vaping company are really only for adults and are here to support public health, why do you align yourself with the biggest tobacco company in the nation? And here's a quote from that. The ability to attract new smokers and develop them into a young adult franchise is the key to brand development. So this is an industry that has a well-documented past of targeting kids. And that's where this epidemic is right now. So a lot of vaping is not happening with people like you guys. It's happening with our children. I'm getting calls from middle schools and high schools around Philly that we're responding to about kids vaping in bathrooms and teachers just like, what do I do? How do I handle this? What should I be saying? Okay, bringing it on home. Have they changed? Because I know you can say, Ryan, you use a lot of quotes in the 80s and 90s. Surely the tiger changes stripes. The leopard changes its spots. They're not the same as they once were. They can't be, right? You can't be doing things. You can't be adding asbestos to filters in 2019, right? That's never going to fly. So what am I showing you here is the uh, org chart, if you will, of a crime syndicate. This is a mafia family structure, bosses and under bosses, uh, capitals and soldiers, consigliaries. You're like, hey, I saw the Godfather. I know where you're going with this. But this just kind of came to a head a short time ago. In 1999, so about 20 years ago, a lawsuit, this is crazy, the Department of Justice brought a lawsuit against the tobacco industry saying they're a crime syndicate. And they were prosecuted under the RICO Act. So the RICO Act was used to bring down the mob. And so they actually said, just like we talked about with like them all testifying the nicotine wasn't addicted in, in mass, again, when they're collectively threatened, they, they coordinate. When they're in the marketplace, they're fierce competitors. But what this basically said is they lied to defraud the American public. And so they had to issue these corrective statements in major on TV and on newspapers. And sadly, through years and years of appeals, they've been watered down, so they're not as effective as they originally started out as. But here's an example of this. Anyone see this, either on the news or in a newspaper, maybe? And that's the shame of it right there, right? This is them basically saying, you know, we lied. We knew this was harmful, we knew we were doing wrong, and we're coming clean about it. But look at that top statement. A federal court has ordered, this is, these are tobacco industry ads here. How many of you have kids? How many of you, uh, your kids ever like hurt their brother or sister accidentally, and you ask them to say they're sorry, and they say, mom is telling me to tell you that I'm sorry? That's kind of what this is, right? A federal court said we had to do this, so we're doing it. But in actuality, it's not them really admitting any wrongdoing or guilt. But the point being is that they were prosecuted as racketeers, as a crime syndicate by the Department of Justice. Can the Tiger change his stripes? This quote is from 2015. And this is Susan Cameron, the head of Reynolds America International, saying she is looking more, things are looking more like the good old days, where there's more profits and less litigation. So this isn't her saying, like, we've changed, we've become a different company. It's like, I miss things when they were in the 50s. We were making a lot of money, we weren't getting sued. And this was said just four years ago. So are they really changing in some way is debatable. So my message for you is this. If you strip away all the liberties, freedoms, rights, it's glamorous, it's sophisticated, it's elegant, in my opinion, the heart of this issue is a social justice one. This is a commercial strip not far from where we are here in Rittenhouse, and that's a commercial strip uh, in North Philadelphia. You will not see dollar stores selling cheap menthols and black and miles in Rittenhouse. Similarly, it's about parity and equality. That's that walk to school uh, on Frankfurt Ave in North Philly, where you pass 16 tobacco retailers from home at point A to the middle school at point B, and that's the one tobacco retailer you'll pass on the same distance walking to school in Chestnut Hill. That's wrong on every level, that a child in the city should see something totally different just by virtue of their walk to school for something that we know causes addiction, disease, and death. And these are the types of retail establishments you'll see in these neighborhoods. You won't find check cashing establishments selling discount Newports, again, in Chestnut Hill. 
And this is about our children, because they are the bread and butter of the tobacco epidemic. Without children, the tobacco industry can't sustain this. So protecting our children, not just from heart to hearts around the dinner table, but policy, the things that we do in the health department, to change the context of physical, social, and economic environments are paramount to protecting children and ending this epidemic. Because this is entirely preventable. Single grades preventable cause of death and disability. Around 30 million adults smoke, 1,300 smokers die every day. 3,000 kids try their first cigarette, two out of three become addicted to it. That's how addictive nicotine is. And about uh, one, uh, one in three of those young people eventually die prematurely from their tobacco use. So I'll talk to you guys more in the discussion point, but this is what we're doing to fight back against them. We're using the full arsenal of CDC best practices in the health department, from media to policy, to preventing initiation to helping smokers quit. What can you do? So now we've, called, we've stoked the fires of anger within you. Here's what you can do is organize against this industry. And I'll leave you with this example. Cultures can change. I personally have worked in public housing, veteran care settings, behavioral health, with decades and decades and decades of an ingrained culture and context around tobacco use. We've worked in behavioral health agencies where folks were given 7 to 11 smoke breaks a day. Everyone outside smoked a cigarette, everyone back in after group, if you were good, you get an extra smoke break. If you don't, you lose a smoke break. Where that was the norm. And now drug and alcohol treatment facilities are going tobacco free and filled heard about that? That's happening. And the sky isn't falling around our ears. The sun hasn't waked out, right? So cultures can change, but they can happen dramatically or gradually, but it's still culture change. Who knows what this is here on the right? Astra. Car, Astra. Oh, yeah. Car, Astra. I know, it's so great, right? Because you have to really look at that. You're like, I think I've seen that, but it's been a long time. That's a car asteroid. When do car asteroids go away? Does anyone know? I don't know. And I eat, live, and breathe this stuff. So, like, that's a huge deal, right? That was standard issue in every Dodge, Chrysler, or Buick for decades. And then it just kind of went away. And it's a change compartment, and the cigarette lighter is now a charger. But that was huge when that happened. But did anyone say, by God, we need to have our car ashtrays back? This is an affront to the liberties and freedoms of our great nation. No one said that, right? Everyone was just like, yeah, it's gone. That makes sense. But when this happened, this was huge. And this was public, but still culture changed. Joe Camel, there was a time when more five-year-olds recognized Joe Camel than Mickey Mouse. It's a study, a public health study that shows this to be true. But like that went under litigation in the master settlement agreement. But both of these are culture changed, but it still happened. So culture can change, but we have to be the ones to change it by exposing the face of the industry digitally, and verbally, and there are people that have done this. This is Terry Hall here. You may not even know who she is. She died in 2013, but she, I'll fast forward to the punchline, she died of tobacco-related illness. But before she died, and she died in Winston-Salem, smoking bandages, the same Winston-Salem that is the headquarters of Reynolds American International. And that's her just before her death. And she devoted her last days to using her voice to inform the public about the real harms of tobacco. It's one of the most successful ad campaigns the CDC has ever done. It's a tip from former smokers. So that's her in a hospital bed shortly before her death. Sadly, some people will get that choice. Small boroughs are called cowboy killers because several Marlboro men have died from tobacco-related illnesses, even though they used to promote tobacco products. And I'll leave you with quitting. Quitting sounds like a course you're the health department. Of course, you're going to say I should quit smoking, right? But quitting is, yes, a way to reclaim your time, health, and money, but it's actually a way to defy this industry as well. They only have this money to do this to people with, with every pack that we walk in and buy on the counter, day in and day out. So if we quit, we deprive them of their lifeline. The vote that we cast to keep them empowered continue to do this to individuals, families, and communities. I sent an uh, electronic copy of this to Betsy that she can share, but anyone in Philly, yourselves included, or those you love or care about, for instance, you can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW and get free medications, free coaching, sent right to your house, right over the phone. It's an extraordinary resource. They have medications that can help you quit. And you can also, uh, I can talk to you about this upstairs as well, about how to make a recovery plan to get started with the recovery from tobacco. So this is my number here and my email. If anyone has any questions, even after today, feel free to get in touch with me. And I hope that this 
inspired a lot of questions that you may have, and look forward to digging into that in the discussion portion upstairs. <coughs> but I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. I think this issue is of incredible importance, but I know it's been kind of, kind of passe, right? I don't let anyone that smokes. My family doesn't smoke, my friends. But we're very much trying to keep this issue at the forefront, because as you saw from the earlier data, this is a severe challenge to the life and livelihood of Philadelphians, though not equally especially for more vulnerable communities. So thank you for devoting just a few moments of your day to day uh, for this important discussion. I'm looking forward to talking to you upstairs as well. Um, I think we'll take questions later, is that right? Yes. Okay, well thank you guys so much. This is really good. Cool.